Good evening and welcome to Gravitas. I'm Palki Sharma Upadhyay. Let's get started. Last year, Make China Pay became a rallying cry. 18 months into the pandemic, it sounds like a tired, tepid slogan, something that everyone agrees with and no one acts on, a bit like fight climate change or eradicate hunger. I know it sounds like a sweeping statement, but there's a reason why we make it tonight. Countries around the world are struggling with wave after wave. The fear of variants looms. Lockdowns are crushing economies. Four million people have died, 40 lakh people dead. What is China doing? Celebrating 100 years of the Communist Party. What is China's president doing? Building a museum to glorify himself. But what about the people of China? They're fighting another disease outbreak. This time it's a new variant of swine flu. It's been spreading across districts but the government is yet to act and why would they? If a deadly pandemic could not shake the president's grip on power and his country's hold on global business, why should China bother with outbreaks until they blow in the world's face? On Gravitas tonight, we'll tell you about the country's latest outbreak and its leader's latest propaganda push. Also on the show, UNESCO has downgraded the Great Barrier Reef, saying it's, a, it's in danger and Australia blames China for this. We'll tell you why. Was the G7 summit a super spreader event? Wuhan virus cases in Cornwall have shot up after the global power party. Jeff Bezos is going to space next month and thousands of people across the world have filed a petition saying he should not be allowed to come back on Earth. And Europe may grant its people the right to disconnect. If you're away from work, you don't have to be chained to it via your phone. We begin as always with Gravitas Global Headlines. The Pentagon says the U.S. military may slow down its withdrawal from Afghanistan in the face of rising violence from Taliban insurgents. While there is a schedule, we are mindful that that schedule could fluctuate and change as, as conditions change too. This as the insurgent group made new gains and seized control of a key district in the country's northern Kunduz province. A new documentary highlights the role of the Paris attack conspirator in the planning and execution of the 2008 Mumbai attacks in India. Mohammed Ghani Usman is a Pakistani national and lashkar e taiba terrorist. He is currently in a French jail in connection with the 2015 attack in Paris. The North Korean leader's sister, Kim Yo-jong, says that the U.S. appears to be interpreting signals from Pyongyang in a way that would lead to disappointment. North Korea ridiculed American hopes for talks, saying that the Biden administration was interpreting the situation in a way to seek comfort for itself. Hong Kong's leader Carrie Lam defends the crackdown on the Apple Daily newspaper by saying that any criticism of the move was an attempt to beautify acts that endanger national security. Apple Daily, a staunch critic of Beijing, is set to close for good after its executives were arrested. The US, UK, EU and Canada pledged to make Lukashenko's regime run dry through new travel bans and asset freezes on senior Belarusian officials. The extension of sanctions from Western countries is aimed to punish Belarus for its arrest of journalist Raman Pratasevich. 
The United Nations annual report states that violence against children in war-torn countries soared in 2020, made worse by the pandemic. Child abduction rose 90% while rape and sexual abuse of children rose 70% compared to the previous year. Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen and Somalia emerged as the most dangerous places for children in 2020. The Trump Organization has sued the city of New York after it ended its contract for a golf course following the attack on U.S. Capitol on January 6th. Trump's company alleges wrongful termination, adding that the city's mayor had incited others to end business with Trump-related entities. Take a jab or be jailed, threatened Philippine President Rodrigo Duterte. As the country battles vaccine hesitancy among its population, the Philippines is facing one of Asia's worst COVID outbreaks and has fully vaccinated around 2.1 million people out of 110 million up until now. Argentina and Chile have both booked their spots in the quarterfinals of the Copa America with a game to spare. Argentina rode a 10th minute goal from Alejandro Lopez to edge Paraguay 1-0 in Brasilia, even as Lionel Messi celebrated a record equaling 147th international appearance. Chile played out a 1-1 draw against Uruguay, with Eduardo Vargas's first half opener cancelled out by Luis Suarez just beyond the hour mark. Carl Nassib of the Las Vegas Raiders has become the first active player in the 101-year history of the NFL to publicly come out as gay. The 28-year-old said that he had agonized over this moment for the last 15 years, but finally felt comfortable enough to get it off his chest. Nassib's announcement has been met with numerous messages of support from fellow NFL players, teams and leadership, as well as global sports icons like Billie Jean King. The Wuhan virus is a cruel gift from China that keeps on giving. It has left patients with never-ending symptoms. It has left countries with new and deadlier variants. It has left the global economy with losses worth trillions of dollars and counting. Who is being held accountable for all of this? Not the government of China. It is doing business as usual, quite literally. And certainly not the leader of China, who is only further cementing his place as one of the country's tallest leaders. 18 months and 4 million deaths later, China remains a global disease incubator and its president is building a museum, no less, to glorify himself. Tonight on Gravitas, we'll tell you about China's latest outbreak and Xi Jinping's latest propaganda push. Let's start with the outbreak. China is doing nothing to stop the spread of deadly diseases since the pandemic began. And we've told you this. China has reported an outbreak of the influenza virus, bubonic plague, brucellosis, bird flu, and now swine flu. This is the latest outbreak in China, rising cases of swine flu. New variants of, quote unquote, an African swine fever virus are spreading across the country, which is basically swine flu or the H1N1 virus. It's a human respiratory infection that started in pigs. At least six provinces in China have reported cases since last year. And since then, the virus has been spreading. It is mutating. And now it is becoming difficult to detect. Reports say the new variants of the swine flu are harder to trace. Farms are reporting only mild symptoms in pigs. So it goes undetected until the infection spreads across farms and everyone is sick. And that makes it very hard to contain. So what is the government doing? Well, China has known about the swine flu outbreak for a while now. This year, in the month of February, researchers at a veterinary institute published a report. They documented the new variants, but the government has taken no action. The virus continues to spread. What is the Chinese government busy doing then? It's hard at work trying to immortalize its president. This year, the Communist Party of China is celebrating its 100th birthday. A giant museum has been built to celebrate its achievements. That's what they call them. It's like a temple of propaganda. This museum has more than 2,600 pictures, 3,500 sets of cultural relics, a virtual simulation of a war that obviously shows how China prevailed over its adversaries. Where is the president in all of this? Well, practically everywhere. You could call this Xi Jinping's museum. 
He features more prominently than any other Chinese leader, except perhaps for Mao Zedong, the founding father of modern-day China. Consider these figures. Xi Jinping appears in 12 photographs. In contrast, Deng Xiaoping, the man who led China's economic reform, features in just four. Xi Jinping's immediate predecessors, Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin, are featured in just three of them. And propaganda on Xi Jinping is not limited to this museum. Ahead of the 100th birthday celebrations, the Communist Party mouthpiece, the People's Daily, has published a list of 100 quotes from past Chinese leaders. And in this list of quotes, there are 30 quotes from Xi Jinping, 30 from Mao Zedong, only 14 from Deng Xiaoping, 10 from Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin, and the rest are from other leaders. So the world struggles with a virus from China. Chinese people struggle with new variants of swine flu. But the Chinese president is busy drafting his place in history, his over arching presence across Chinese propaganda right now sends a clear message. Xi Jinping wants to project himself as the greatest leader of China since Mao. And you would think that the pandemic may have weakened his place. But I'm afraid that's not true. Last week, Xi Jinping paid a visit to the Communist Party Museum with senior leaders. Look at this photograph. Here is Xi Jinping standing right in front of the 25-member Politburo, which is the main decision-making body of the Communist Party of China. These are the people who run the country. What is the Chinese president up to? Well, he's administrating a loyalty pledge to senior leaders. Standing behind Xi, the members vow to work hard for the party, observe the party constitution, fulfill member duties, strictly observe party discipline, guard party secrets, fight for communism throughout their lives, and never betray the party. But what is the Communist Party of China? One man embodies it, and that man is Xi Jinping, president of China since 2013, also the general secretary of the Communist Party, the chairman of the Central Military Commission, the ultimate decision-making body on military matters in China. He's called the chairman of all things in China, by the way. No other leader since Mao Zedong has enjoyed this much power in the Chinese system. And there's zero tolerance for dissent against him. So by taking this oath for the party, the CCP members are basically pledging their loyalty to Xi Jinping. Long story short, at home Xi Jinping's position looks rock solid. And outside, world leaders are still only talking about how to make China pay. 18 months of horror, more than 4 million deaths, more than 179 million cases later. This is what we have. And talking about making China pay, there was an attempt to do this earlier this month. The world's top economic powers met in Cornwall for the G7 summit. It was the first in-person meeting of world leaders in a long time, so naturally the stakes were high. Would the leaders and their massive entourage trigger a Wuhan virus outbreak? It's been 10 days since the summit ended. The G7 circus has moved on, but in Cornwall, things are bad. Wuhan virus cases in the county surged 2,500% after the summit. So was the G7 a super spreader event? And if it was, what does it mean for future summits and global events? And today, we're taking a step towards that moment when we learn to live responsibly with COVID, when we cease eventually to rely on detailed government edicts and make our own decisions. I'm going to pass that, one. that was Boris Johnson on the 10th of May. A cautious victory call after three rounds of lockdown. Live responsibly with COVID, he said. A lesson he would ignore exactly a month later. June 11th, 2021. The G7 assembled in the southern corner of England in this sleepy county called Cornwall. A dozen world leaders descended on these beaches. Accompanying them were hundreds of staffers and security details. They met. They drank. They barbecued and they left. Not exactly COVID responsible. More than a week later, this is the result. The Wuhan virus cases in Cornwall have surged 2,500%. Local businesses and residents are on high alert. Some have shut down completely. Far from leaving a legacy, the G7 has left a health crisis. Look at these numbers. 
On June 2nd, Cornwall recorded four cases per 100,000 people. By June 16th, it rose to 131 cases. Only one event separated these dates, the G7 summit. But how did the virus breach Fortress Cornwall? Certainly wasn't the leaders. Most of them arrived fully vaccinated. But what about their entourage? An estimated 20,000 international visitors attended the summit. They were staffers, advisors and security details. There were locals too, including cops, hospitality workers and protesters. So did any of them breach the bio bubble? Did the UK government hide the risks? Downing Street's response is complicating matters. This is what a spokesperson for Boris Johnson had to say. We are confident that there were no cases of transmission to the local residents. All attendees were tested. Everyone involved in the G7 work were also tested during their work on the summit. But is there any evidence to back this claim? The UK government had conducted a risk assessment on holding an in-person summit. And those documents are still locked away. They could hold the key to clearing the government or implicating them. So locals in Cornwall smell a cover-up. At $100 million, the G7 bubble was among the most expensive ones. Still, it wasn't enough. Most of the cops, chefs and hoteliers at G7 were young Britons. Some were yet to be vaccinated. The summit put all the foreign delegates inside the bubble, but the host workers were piled outside. It was a super spreader waiting to happen. Cornwall's experience should be a lesson to the world. To all the summits being planned, and the tournaments being played. The organizers shield the players and the delegates. But what happens to those outside this bubble of privilege? To all the businesses and the fans? Have world leaders and football players suddenly become frontline workers? Bureau Report, we on. World is one. The Delta variant has now spread to more than 80 countries, 8-0. The world is struggling to control it. The variant, meanwhile, is mutating. So what we have now is called the Delta Plus. It has already spread to at least nine countries. Our next report tells you why the world needs to watch out for this one. Mutations have supercharged the virus. The Delta variant drove India's deadly second wave. Now, this mutation has taken another form. It is called the Delta Plus, and it is spreading. Reports say its earlier sample has been traced back to Europe. In India, the Delta Plus variant has been detected in at least three states. It is believed to be more infectious. There is no indication yet if it's deadlier than the other variants. But experts are already worried about it. Because this variant could trigger the next wave of cases worldwide. Reports say around 200 cases of the Delta Plus variant have been detected across the world. The variant has been found in at least nine countries. This includes the United Kingdom, Portugal, Switzerland, Poland, Japan, Nepal, China and Russia. In India alone, 30 cases of the Delta Plus have been detected. The Indian government has termed Delta Plus as a variant of interest. Scientists are still studying if this variant can escape the immunity of vaccines because there is reason to believe that the Delta Plus is resistant to monoclonal antibody cocktails. This is a treatment method where patients are injected with artificially manufactured proteins that prevent the virus from attacking the body. If dangerous mutations were not enough, new findings into the long-term impact of Wuhan virus infections have sparked fresh concerns. Scientists in the UK have been trying to understand the effect of the Wuhan virus on the brain. They have found that even a mild infection could lead to substantial loss of grey matter in the brain. British researchers examined brain MRIs of patients before and after they got infected. 
Most of them had mild to moderate forms of infection. Their MRI suggested brain damage. In areas that help us detect smell and taste, cognitive function and memory formation. Not everyone will suffer brain damage from the Wuhan virus. But the study shows the possibility can't be ruled out. And with new mutations, the risk of long-term illness is only growing. Bureau Report, we on World is One. It takes a strategic mind to weaponize trade and history but a sinister one to weaponize nature. And that's exactly what China is doing to Australia, targeting their most iconic geographical landmark, the Great Barrier Reef. It is one of the seven natural wonders of the world, a sprawling city below the waves. It's so big that you can actually see it, see it from space, a chain of 900 islands spread across 340,000 square kilometers. Quite simply, a marvel of nature. For Australia, it's also a big source of income. Nearly 5 million tourists visit the Barrier Reef every year. They splurge money on diving, on hotels, on water sports. There's a big industry living off the reefs. But that tourism tab could soon run dry. Let me tell you how. In 1981, the Great Barrier Reef was declared a World Heritage Site. That status is now in danger. A UNESCO panel says the reefs are at risk. So what are they proposing? to shift the barrier reef from the World Heritage List to the Heritage in Danger List. And this is a big downgrade. It could cost Australia millions of dollars. You see, an endangered site requires protection, which means restrictions on diving, on swimming, exploring around the reefs. For years, Australia has been fighting this downgrade. So what has changed this time? Well, until now, UNESCO's decisions were rooted in science. But the new committee chair is not big on logic or science. Instead, it specializes in vendetta politics. You probably guessed who we're talking about. China. The panel that proposed this downgrade was headed by China. Beijing has an axe to grind with Australia. It dates back to last year. Australia's prime minister demanded a probe into the origins of the Wuhan virus. China was trying to avoid a probe at all costs. Australia pushed for it. And since then, Australia is on China's radar. So here's the question. Is China hijacking UNESCO to settle a political score? Well, Australia certainly thinks so. And looking at China's record, you wouldn't put it past them. So this decision was flawed. Clearly there were politics behind it. Clearly those politics have subverted a proper process. And for the World Heritage Committee to not even foreshadow this listing is, I think, appalling. How has China responded to this? With a defiant denial. For Beijing, this is all part of a grand plan to defame them. Stock propaganda there, nothing new. But China's influence at UNESCO is undeniable. It is more about politics than culture. In 2019, the United States left UNESCO and this created a leadership vacuum. And China was more than happy to step in. Today, it contributes $40 million to the UNESCO budget. That's a lot of power. Unfortunately, China is not conserving culture with this power. Instead, it has politicized UNESCO, and I can give you examples for this. In 2017, a vast Tibetan area was declared a World Heritage Site. It was China's idea. Tibetan groups were staunchly opposed to it, but in the end, it did not matter. China made some vague promises and got the proposal passed. Here's another example. The UNESCO runs an institute called the IBE, that's International, the International Bureau of Education, IBE. It helps the member states manage curriculum, teaching, and assessment. The IBE is headquartered in Geneva, but China is lobbying for a relocation. And if Beijing has its way, this UNESCO institute could soon be in Shanghai. And this is happening in all United Nations agencies, a complete hijack by China. When the UN was first established, people used to say this about America. The headquarters was in New York. So if you wanted to address the assembly, you had to fly in. And now China is doing the same, filling the UN roster with its diplomats and relocating agencies inside its boundaries. Can this strategy be countered? Well, yes, it can. The United Nations is a democracy at least technically.
Every country, big or small, gets one vote. It's the same in the UNESCO. The World Heritage Committee has 21 members. They can choose to vote down China's proposal and retain the Great Barrier Reef in the World Heritage List. But the question is, can rational voices get to them before China does? And speaking of rational voices, Jeff Bezos is going to space next month. The billionaire will be zooming past the atmosphere in a capsule designed by a company that he owns. Bezos will be crossing what is called the Kármán line, or the imaginary line between the Earth and space, for a minute or two. And thousands of people across the world are now demanding that Jeff Bezos should not be allowed to return to Earth once, once he crosses that line. Petitions are being signed online. Is that even an option? Do not allow a person to return to Earth. And has it ever happened before? Here's a report. Jeff Bezos is going to space. I want to go on this flight because it's a thing I've wanted to do all my life. It's an adventure. It's a big deal for me. The Amazon founder will blast off from West Texas on the 20th of July. That's the logo of Blue Origin the rocket company that Bezos has founded. On the 20th of July, its new Shepard crew capsule will scream through the atmosphere and head straight for space. Three minutes into the journey, Bezos will feel weightless. He will be able to unbuckle himself from his seat and float around in this cabin. Below will be a breathtaking view of the Earth. For a minute or two, the capsule will cross the Kármán line which is the imaginary line separating Earth from space. For a minute or two, Bezos will be in space. The capsule will then begin its fall back on Earth. Three parachutes will guide it back to the Texas desert, where the capsule is expected to land gently. The entire journey will last around 11 minutes. It will be fully automated, meaning there will be no pilots or astronauts on board. But that does not mean Jeff Bezos will be alone. I really want you to come with me. Would you? Are you serious? I am. I think it would be meaningful. I have my brother there. I wasn't even expecting him to say that he was going to be on the first flight. And then when he asked me to go along, I was just awestruck. You, Seriously? If you're willing, if you want oh my to. God. Yeah. Joining Bezos on board will be his brother, Mark and an auction winner who has paid $28 million for a seat on the flight. Bezos announced his journey on Instagram, but the reaction was not as he may have expected. I want to go on this flight because it's a thing I've wanted to do all my life. It's an adventure. It's a big deal for me. Go by all means, but don't come back. That's what thousands of people around the world are saying to the Amazon founder. Petitions are being signed to not allow Bezos to return to Earth. We are not joking. Look! This petition says Bezos is an evil overlord who is hell-bent on global domination. Moral of the story? Don't let him come back. Another says billionaires should not exist, neither on Earth nor in space. So. Don't allow Jeff Bezos to return to Earth. Over 75,000 people have signed the petition. The reasons are various and many. Being let back into Earth is a privilege, not a right. One less billionaire on this planet could save tons of carbon. The question is, can Bezos be stopped from landing back on Earth? Not really. Bezos will be traveling to space on a capsule his company owns. Coordinating the journey will be employees whose salaries Bezos pays. What's more, banning his return will also keep two other poor souls stranded in space. So the idea of not letting Bezos re-enter the Earth may not fly. But we can introduce you to someone who was legit stuck in space. Sergei Krikalev a Russian astronaut. He blasted off for space from the Soviet Union in 1991. From space, Krikalev saw the USSR collapse. The country that had promised to bring him back was gone. And with it, Krikalev's ladder back to Earth. 
So Krikalev spent 311 days in space. He circled the Earth 5,000 times before he could finally be brought back. Bureau Report, we own. World is one. Almost a century after Adolf Hitler expelled Jews from his armed forces, Germany has appointed a chief rabbi for its military. The move marks symbolic restitution for the Jewish community. In 2019, Germany's government had approved a proposal by the Central Council of Jews to restore religious counseling for Jewish soldiers in the military. Here's a report. A rabbi in the German army till recently was unthinkable. During World War I, many Jews fought for Germany. Dozens of rabbis are known to have performed pastoral work in the German military. But then came Adolf Hitler with his rise to power in 1933. The Nazis dominated the political landscape as a result. The Jews were excluded from all spheres of public life. The repression took unimaginable proportions. Between 1941 and 45, some 6 million Jews were systematically murdered across German-occupied Europe. Now, after almost 100 years, since before the Holocaust, 42-year-old Hungarian-born Zor Bala has been installed as Germany's first military rabbi. Priests and pastors already provide religious services to Christians in the German military. The equivalent, however, was not available to around 300 Jewish soldiers in the military until now. For the first time in 100 years, there will again be military rabbis in the German armed forces. Together with the Protestant and Catholic pastors, the military rabbis will be an important pillar for our soldiers. The ceremony took place at a library synagogue with the country's defense minister. Israel's ambassador to Germany was also in attendance. Today, we are strengthening something which specially in light of Germany's history means a lot, even though it almost sounds banal. Normality, a normality which recognizes that Jewish life, Jews belong to Germany and that Judaism belongs to the German army. Germany's Jewish leader, Joseph Schuster, also addressed the German soldiers. I have an idea what you had in mind when you heard that there would now be a Germany army rabbi. You probably imagined an old man with a white beard, long temple curls and a large hat. Maybe also a man who would now very closely watch morale. Indeed, morale is important to Rabbi Bala. But other than that, I can assure you that as a trained industrial engineer, he knows of the difficulties when there is a problem in logistics. The move comes at a time when there are several reports of right-wing extremism within the military and the police in recent years, and also amid rising levels of anti-Semitism across the country. We all agree it is the responsibility of every Democrat to fight anti-Semitism, and I will say very clearly this is a highly personal responsibility for each and every one of us, also for myself. Just like the Christian chaplains, the rabbi will offer counseling to the soldiers apart from holding religious services. Bureau Report We on World is One. Eighty years ago, on this very day, Adolf Hitler made his biggest mistake. He pointed his soldiers and tanks to the east. He poked Europe's sleeping war machine, the Soviet Union. We are talking about the early 1940s. The Nazis had already taken France. Practically all of Europe was under Hitler's thumb. So an expansion to the east was always on the cards. But the Soviets were not prepared. You see, before the war started, Hitler and Stalin had signed a non-aggression pact. What did it say? Germany and the USSR would not attack each other for the next 10 years. But Stalin made the same mistake as Britain. Took Hitler for his word. On June 22, 1941, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union. The Blitzkrieg completely battered Soviet defenses. Around 5 million Soviet troops were captured. 3.3 million soldiers were killed. Victory seemed within reach for Hitler, but that's when the tide turned. In Russia, you aren't just fighting the troops, you see. 
You're battling the elements. As winter came, the Soviet troops dug in. But Germany was not ready for this battle of attrition. The pushback was too much. The Nazi offensive stalled in Moscow. And in the south, Stalingrad was retaken. It was the beginning of the end for Hitler. The Allies soon joined hands. The Soviets drove the Germans back from the east. The Western troops pushed from the other side. Hitler was boxed in and defeated. It was the worst fighting of the Second World War. Millions of young men were condemned to their death, but all that doom and disaster forged the world order that we see today. The Allies have since parted ways. One of them, the Soviet Union, does not even exist anymore. But in Russia, the tall tales still inspire the next generation. Tales of how their ancestors repelled the Nazi juggernaut. It's a tradition that current President Vladimir Putin has been careful to project. He visits the World War II memorial frequently. It's called the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier. He comes, lays a bouquet at the tomb and speaks a few words. This was his message on the 80th anniversary of the Nazi invasion today. This day, June 22nd, there is still indignation and sorrow in the hearts of all generations. It is painful due to the broken destinies of millions of people. Because of these challenges, those terrible years are literally imprinted in our memory. But what does Putin make of the Soviet Union? Well, he worked for them as a spy. Some accounts say he was in Germany when the Berlin Wall was toppled. But his relation with the former state is complicated. Putin is no fan of communism. At the same time, he cherished the Union, the sprawling empire that once challenged America. Even today, Putin has not given up on expanding Russia. In 2008, he ordered troops into Georgia, a former Soviet state. In 2014, he annexed Crimea. All the signs are there. Putin dreams of regaining Russia's lost glory. And he isn't scared of another Cold War. Let me read out some of Putin's words. And this is from an opinion piece that he wrote in a German daily today. And these are his words. We hope that the end of the Cold War would be a common victory for Europe. It is exactly with this logic in mind, the logic of building a greater Europe united by common values and interests, that Russia has sought to develop its relations with the Europeans. But a different approach has prevailed. It is based on the expansion of the North Atlantic Alliance, which was itself a relic of the Cold War. After all, it was specifically created for the confrontation of that era. Putin despises the Western Alliance. He considers NATO's expansion to be an insult. Think about it. NATO's rival, the Warsaw Pact, was signed in Poland. And today, Poland itself is a member of NATO. And now there's talk of including Ukraine except that some Europeans are not on board. They fear this will further antagonize Putin, and they're right. The Russian president understands the brewing conflict. Let me quote again from what he said. The whole system of European security has now degraded significantly. Tensions are rising, and the risks of a new arms race are becoming real. How seriously should we take Vladimir Putin's analysis? Well, some experts dismiss Russia as an old power, the 11th biggest economy, no match for Europe. But here's the other side of that analysis. Russia still holds the second largest nuclear arsenal in the world. Its leader is a Cold War era spy who dreams of Soviet glory days. So Putin's analysis is extremely serious. His beef with NATO is, not un is also understandable. Nobody wants a rival alliance planting flags in their backyard. The problem is, Putin's own strategy in Eastern Europe is problematic. This year's massive military build-up near Ukraine was an example. The president's ambitions are overshooting his country's own strength. But the KGB officer in him does not give up. Neither does the Russian nationalist. The war against Germany was the best of Russia. Putin probably grew up hearing those stories. For him, Russia's place is at the table of superpowers, anything less is unacceptable. And since we are talking about old stories, did you know that the Ho Chi Minh City was once called Saigon? New York was called New Amsterdam. Cities have been named and renamed numerous times in history, sometimes to suit the colonizer's tongue and sometimes to suit the ruling party's politics. Here's the latest 
in that series. South Africa has renamed the city of Port Elizabeth. Authorities say they want the city's name to reflect local culture, local language and heritage. Some people protested. The authorities refused to oblige. Our next report takes you back in history where some of our most popular global cities had different names. When Juliet said, what's in a name, she totally discounted history. We will show you why. Recognize this country? India has long had a cultural influence in Singapore. That explains why the country gets its name from Sanskrit, Simhapura, meaning the castle of lions. Look at the United States. In its south, you have Spanish names, San Antonio, Santa Fe, San Diego. In Central America, you have French names, St. Louis, Louisiana. These names reflect historical influences. History tells us that South Africa was once a British colony. That's why the country has cities with English names. For example, Port Elizabeth. The airport of East London is not in London, but in South Africa. It's there that you also have the city of King Williamstown. But send a letter to that address and you are likely to have it returned to your mailbox. For the city of King Williamstown no longer exists. It is now Konse. The government of President Soro Ramaphosa is on a renaming spree. It is trying to accelerate away from the shadows of the colonial past and is leaving behind English names. Port Elizabeth has now become Kubera. Utenage is Karicha. Not everyone in South Africa is happy. Some 13,000 objections were sent to the authorities. All of them are being rejected. 23rd of February 2021, the department gazetted 23 names that Minister Matetwa had approved um, on geographical name changes in the Eastern Cape, including the renaming of Port Elizabeth to Kebeha. In the latest statement issued by the minister, he has reiterated that one of the main purposes of the South African Geographical Names Council Act gazetted in 1998 is to transform South Africa and ensure that names of these places in the country reflect the languages, culture and heritage of the majority of the people in this country. What about history? The issue is political and a tricky one across the world. Look at India. All major Indian port cities have been renamed in the last 70 years. Bombay has become Mumbai. Panjim has become Panaji. Trivandrum is Tiruvannantrapuram. On the other side of the coast, Madras is Chennai. Pondicherry has become Puducherry. Visag is now Vishakhapatnam. And Kolkata is Kolkata. What led to the rechristening? India's reasons are almost the same as South Africa's. In some cases, like Turuvan, Tapuram and Kolkata, the names have been restored to what they were called in the British era. The colonial masters renamed the cities to suit their tongue. And now parties in power are renaming them to suit their politics. In 2018, the city of Allahabad in India's heartland was renamed Prayagraj. Prayag was the city it was called before Akbar named it Ilahabas or the abode of God in 1575. Two years ago, the government of West Bengal wanted to change the name of the state to Bangla. The government was unhappy that it figured at the bottom of every discussion owing to its name beginning with the letter W. Bangla with the B was to boost its position alphabetically. Place it fourth on the list of Indian states. That proposal was rejected. Our cities and their history have been caught in politics. And this tug of war is an old game. The Vietnamese city of Ho Chi Minh was originally Saigon. That's what the French called it after it took over in 1859. In 1976, with the change of hands, the city junked its colonial name. When the Dutch surrendered the colony of New Amsterdam to the English in 1664, 
They named it New York. Istanbul makes for an interesting example. It has numerous historical names. Byzantium, Augusta Antonina, New Rome, Constantinople. Each name reflects the empire or the ruler that ruled the city. Bureau report, we on, world is one. How often have you taken work calls in the middle of a meal or while driving or when attending your, to your child? How often do you work well beyond your office hours? For most people, it happens almost every day. Today, the line between personal and professional life has blurred. Work from home knows no work-life balance. In many professions, work runs almost parallelly with our lives. Work calls follow us to our vacations, holidays, sick leaves. It is hard to pinpoint where work ends and life outside work begins. Today, whether working from home or outside, most of us are always on standby. And while some of us don't mind this, and a lot of us have gotten used to it, most of us can really do without it. In Europe, lawmakers have passed a resolution. They argue that every individual has the fundamental right to disconnect, meaning you should have the right to not reply to office calls or emails after working hours. You should not be judged or branded unprofessional for not joining Zoom meetings that are calendared well beyond office hours. Your sincerity should not be questioned for deciding to not work over weekends. Of course, there can be exceptions, but expecting an employee to work beyond office hours cannot become a norm. Well, it has become one, especially since a lot of us switched to work from home. The average work day of an employee working from home in Canada, the US, the UK and Austria has become longer by over two hours a day. Before the first lockdown, an average employee in the UK was spending nine hours on business VPN or the business networks. By January 2021, the nine hours increased to 11. In the US, workers were spending 11 hours on VPN instead of eight. In the Netherlands, 10 hours instead of nine. Same with Austria. In France, Italy and Spain, workers were spending one extra hour on business VPNs. A Microsoft survey found that most employees believe that their workload has increased significantly since they started working from home. 62% of team calls and meetings are unscheduled or conducted ad hoc. What about India? One report says Indian employees are working beyond 48 hours a week, well beyond the ILO norms. In situations like these, do we have no option but to put a legal stamp on the right to disconnect? Is it the only way to protect employees from being overworked? In 2017, France set strict work-from-home guidelines. In 2018, a pest control firm called Rentokil was fined for violating the rules. Ireland has introduced a code of conduct around the right to disconnect. Trade unions in the UK are demanding something similar. A majority of EU politicians back a legislation that calls on the European Commissioner to develop a block-wide directive on the right to disconnect. Its supporters cite work-life balance, and many ask, why should employees work for extra hours when they're paid for seven of nine hours of work? Studies have shown that giving employees more leisure time has reduced absenteeism. It has also increased their productivity. There's another school of thought that says the right to disconnect is not practical. We must factor in the difference in time zones and the need to always be on standby when signing up for an emergency service. So what's the solution? If hybrid is to be the future, we must find sustainable and smart solutions to balance work and life, even when working from home. Many companies already have. They're working towards it. One automaker reportedly does not allow employees to access their emails on their phone between 6.15 p.m. and 7 a.m. Where does India figure? The country takes pride in working extra hours, working over the weekend, it is seen as being professional, being more committed. The right to disconnect bill was introduced in India in 2018. It did not pass. In the last three years, though, there has been widespread awareness over mental health, about employee well-being. So he is hoping that that converts into employment policies. I think that's a good note to wrap on. We're leaving you, as always, with Gravitas Images. Thanks very much for watching.
Ah, tá, não vai dar pra ler, não. Imagina.